So as you heard there from Charles Fishman, the success of NASA's Apollo missions to the moon was driven by the Cold War between the United States and then Soviet Union. And the Soviets had made many milestones before the USA got there. Our next guest grew up in communist Hungary at that time, but she was forced to flee to America when her parents, who were journalists, were thrown into jail. Our Walter Isaacson spoke to author and journalist Katy Martin about that pivotal time, about the legacy of her late husband, the legendary diplomat Richard Holbrook, and about the political climate that fueled that infamous blast-off. Cotty, welcome to the show. Thank you, Walter. Delighted to be here. Well, we're talking about the anniversary of the moon landing. Where were you when you first found out? So, uh, I was a teenager. I was watching, uh, I was gathered in front of America's hearth, which was Walter Cronkite and CBS Evening News, my parents' ritual. And we sat there, and we were relatively new arrivals to this country. I did not speak English as well as... I think I speak now. And we watched uh, with all the pride of, uh, of new Americans. And when uh, Uncle Walter removed his glasses, we knew that this was a historic moment and that he was as moved as we were, because the only other time he'd done that was on November 22, 1963, JFK's uh, tragic death. And that was such a memorable moment, and, and I was proud to be an American. It was interwoven with mm. the Cold War yes. and our competition with Russia. And more than anybody I know, you have a family history mm. that deals with the Cold War, starting with mm. your parents. Yes, unfortunately, sometimes I think a little too much history. Mm. But um, yes, I, I'm a child of the Cold War. My my parents were in an act of uh, state-sponsored uh, terror. They, my parents were were arrested when I was six years old on fake charges. They truly were fake charges of being uh, CIA agents. They were my mother and father were the last independent journalists behind the Iron Curtain in and, Hungary. In Hungary, talking. in Budapest, yes. And um, I I did not see my dad for almost two years and my mother for for a whole year. And we were not well known at all. But the uh, story of my parents' arrest was front-page news, mm -hmm. uh, especially the New York Times. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as a result, the State Department made all non-essential travel to Hungary um, uh, prohibited. So as a, as, a, as, as a way to pressure the communist government of Hungary, uh, to release my parents. The result of this coverage of my sister and me as being kind of political orphans was um, offers to adopt us by, you know, sort of average readers of American newspapers. And uh, when we finally made it to these shores, we came on a refugee plane and, and we landed in an army base uh, on the New Jersey Turnpike, Camp Kilmer. And the Marine who processed me, little tyke, uh, noticed that it was my birthday. And, and, um, and from some place, he produced a silver dollar. And by the end of the day, I had six silver dollars, which my mother kept. I wish I knew where she put it, because I can't find it. We were then sped with motorcycle uh, uh, escort to a hotel in Manhattan where they, my mother and father, each were given a George Polk Award. Mm -hmm. uh, cameras popping and, you know, just looking up and everybody looking down at us. We were the model refugee family. Handsome father, pretty mother, pregnant, mm -hmm. um, and, and two little girls. Mm -hmm. And everywhere we went, uh, we had photographers following us, because we became sort of the poster for uh, poster family for for uh, refugees. So that was my first introduction to this big-hearted, generous, welcoming land, which it was then. So your parents got arrested, mm -hmm. being labeled enemies of the people. They were journalists for the Associated Press, I and think. And my in father, the Associated Press, my my mother, United Press International. And what did they write that caused this? You know what, Walter? They were just good reporters. They they wrote 
the, the news of the day, which was generally bad news, mm -hmm. because as Hungary was, was uh, slowly becoming uh, a Soviet satellite after the end of the Second World War, priests and nuns were being arrested, mm -hmm. uh, newspapers were closing, um, people who, who uh, had, quote unquote, bourgeois background uh, were losing their jobs. And it was becoming a terror state. And my parents kept doing this, despite the fact that they, they knew they were targeted. So you arrive in the United States in 1957, just as Sputnik has gone up. When did you become aware of the divisions in American society, that it wasn't just a paradise here? You know, when we arrived, we were so completely uh, stunned by everything that was coming our way. Uh, none of us in my family had ever been to the United States. I didn't speak English. My, my uh, parents were fresh from jail. My mother was pregnant. We had so much to learn. And it, we really just applied ourselves to, uh, to coping, as, as refugees do. I was put in an American school um, and, and, you know, sink or swim. It was, it was quite a while before I realized that it wasn't just uh, on merit that you made your way in this country, and particularly as a girl. And I was always uh, an ambitious girl. Uh, I, I wanted I, I wanted a big life. I wanted to be a journalist. There were very few role models in those days. I, I'm now talking about the 70s, when I was starting out uh, at, uh, in the news business. There were two role models. One of them was Barbara, and the other was Leslie, <laughs> as in Walters and Stahl. And you and became a, a a correspondent and producer yes, for I, I was television. I was a uh, bureau chief uh, for ABC News uh, in Germany. Mm -hmm. And to say that uh, that sexual harassment was endemic is an understatement, but we didn't have a term for it. So you just you just did you just struggled with that and uh, and made your way by being good. <laughs> But that was that was that was a bigger struggle than than the um, than than any other that 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 I faced. That to be to be a woman in in uh, the seventies with big ambitions was was a, a, a great challenge. As part of your experience of the Cold War, it happened at your dinner table. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, your parents mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. are totally disagreeing on Vietnam. On Vietnam. Your father can think that nothing can, America does can be wrong. And we were fighting that Cold War battle at dinner table. Yes, yes. No, it was pretty upsetting. It was the first time that my father and I were, were, were really uh, at odds, because he felt that, that uh, well, that America was, was the, the, the nation that could do no wrong, and that Viet the war in Vietnam was just another ex extension of the Cold War, another battle, just as the one that he was fighting in, in Hungary. Um, and, and it wasn't. It was far more complicated. As, as my husband, Richard Holbrook, was finding out in the Mekong Delta, this was a different kind of war. It was a guerrilla war. And, and I was, you know, I was by then in, in high school and, and uh, kind of a wise guy and, and ha making my own judgments. And, and we really had some, some uh, fractious times. And I don't think my father ever admitted that that it was a, 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 a mistake to have to have sent uh, so many to he obviously he didn't want people to die there but but he he felt that it, that it was mishandled um, and uh, a good a good cause a just cause mm -hmm. to to keep to keep the commies from from the south we we just never agreed there's been a magisterial biography of your late husband, Richard Holbrook, written by George Packer. And in some ways, it includes the whole sweep of the Cold War in our lifetime, mm -hmm. beginning with the lessons of Vietnam, when Richard mm -hmm. was a young Foreign Service mm -hmm. officer. Mm -hmm. What were those lessons of the Cold War, and how did they get applied through, maybe over-applied throughout history? Yes. 
Well, uh, Richard was 23 when he when he landed in his first uh, post, which was which was Vietnam. Um, he was uh, sent into uh, the Mekong Delta to to basically to win hearts and minds. He was not a military guy. He was a fledgling diplomat, fresh out of Brown University, and he learned that that America uh, can't impose its will by sheer. Uh, military uh, might. There are things that are deeper and more important to people than um, than being fat, rich, and happy. <laughs> that that we we have we have deep rooted uh, ties to our to our own culture, to our own history, and and that the the North Vietnamese uh, didn't have you know a tenth of our resources. Uh, in Vietnam, but yet they were winning the war because they were winning the hearts and minds. And so I think it, it gave Richard a, a sense of, of humility uh, about what America uh, can achieve in the uh, w using only weapons, um, and also um, a, a, a sense that that what we stand for, no one else can stand. For, no one else does stand for. Unfortunately, you now look at Vladimir. Putin. Mm. How does that fit into your concept of where the Cold War went? Well, um, for Putin, the end of the Cold War, 1989, he was a KGB officer in Germany. And the night the wall came down uh, was the worst night of his life. Uh, he uh, spent all night burning papers, burning files, burning, and and left Germany in an old car with a 12-year-old washing machine as all he had to show for his many years of service there. Total humiliation. He never got over that humiliation, and his entire program uh, since coming to power in the Kremlin um, has been to reclaim what he sees as Russia's rightful place, um, right next to the United States, as, as a, a world power. Um, President Obama made a mistake in, in referring to Putin as a regional leader. That was, that was uh, such a source of, of uh, anger and humiliation for, for Putin, and only uh, uh, caused him to double his efforts to get at us the only way he knew, which is not with conventional weapons, not with tanks, God knows, mm -hmm. cyber, cyber attack. And he will do it by subverting um, our, our infrastructure and, above all, our values, wreaking havoc, confusion, as he has done, is an enormous triumph for him. I mean, look at look at the way we are uh, toward each other. That is, you can better you better believe it. He's rubbing his hands together somewhere in one of those uh, gilded halls in the Kremlin, saying, "Look at the look at those fools." So, do you think we're in a new Cold War that he started? Um, I don't think it's an I don't think it's a new cold war. I think uh, in some ways it's more serious because we're doing this to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I, there, there, there aren't going to be any any missiles uh, in Cuba or anywhere in our neighborhood. Um, he is content to let us implode from within. And in some ways, that's more serious, because the Cold War was really a rallying cry for Americans to come together, as we did with the, um, with the moonwalk, with the moon launch. Um, it was uh, an outgrowth of the Cold War, of, of the Soviet launch of Sputnik in 1957, which, which kind of was a wake-up call. Um, no, I think that, that, in some ways, this is a more dangerous war, because it targets who we are, our values, and what are we or are we not still the exceptional nation? You're writing a biography of Angela Merkel, mm -hmm. the German chancellor. Do you see her as the last great democratic bulwark against this totalitarianism and the remnants of the Cold War? I do. I do. Merkel is a, is a remarkable uh, story. I mean, she's one of those rare leaders that the closer you get, and the more you know of her, the more impressive she is, because 
she's brilliant, um, she's very analytical, and she is incredibly self-disciplined. Trump cannot get a rise out of her, and neither can Putin, and neither can Erdogan or any of the others. She specializes in deflating macho men. <laughs> and it's it's quite a specialty. I, I, I'm a big admirer. She is not without flaws, however. This is not a hagiography that I'm writing. Um, I, I'm pretty clear-eyed about her. But here's the remarkable thing. For 14 years, she's been the head of the most powerful European nation, Germany. And she's a woman. Um, so how? So that's what I'm trying to to decode. I, I, I don't think we have enough time for me to tell you how she's done it, <laughs> but, but, but she's done it, and, um, and, and she is—she um, has withstood uh, Trump's attempts to humiliate her uh, through sheer intelligence. She considers his attempts, for example, when he fishes out a, a, a piece of candy from his, from his pocket and tosses it, it at at the chancellor, who's a very dignified lady, um, and says, don't, don't, tell, don't say I never gave you anything, Angela. She doesn't even blink. She thinks that's a sign of his own weakness. When Putin unleashes his dog, she's well known to be afraid of, of dogs. She's been bitten a couple of times. To try to shake her up, her staff, Merkel's staff, just goes, just freaks. You know, how can, how can he do that, that swine? And she just says, he's a weak man. He has to assert his, his machismo somehow. So he does it with this big black dog. So everybody cool it. So, you know, that's the kind of discipline and, and the, uh, the, the kind of emotional detachment that you need uh, in, in positions of power. Gotti, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Appreciate Walter. It. It's been a pleasure.